This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Keep that in mind as we go through today. That is Ephesians 6.12. Guys, thank you so much for being here with us today. We are doing something awesome here coming up in the next couple of months. And guys, I know I keep teasing it on the show and I'm going to just, I'm just going to keep doing it. I'm just going to keep leaving you there. I hope to announce a date soon for something amazing that we're going to launch for all of you guys that have been wanting to go deeper with our content. Like you're, you're all bought in Kyle. I'm with you. Let's equip men to push back darkness. Let me be one of those equipped men. I listen to the podcast. I read the devotionals. What else? The what else is coming and it's coming very, very soon, but we can't pull that off without donors. And so I just want to give a quick thank you to all of you out there that have ever donated to Undaunted Life, and especially for you guys that are still currently monthly donors. Guys, we don't have like magic funding coming from somewhere. I didn't have a rich uncle die and leave me all this money. We are only able to produce content because we have guys like you partnering with us. Please hop on board the show. uh, In the show notes, there's a donation page, or you can just go to undaunted.live backslash donate. So in the quick hitters today, I'm going to be covering a lot of ground. We're going to be covering the Biden administration doing everything they can to keep the U.S. southern border open while simultaneously claiming that it's completely secure, the Vatican doubling down on Pope Francis's call to bless same-sex couples, a Florida prosecutor announcing the first death penalty case for child rape, seven men in Texas being arrested for gang gang raping two toddlers in a mall bathroom, USA Boxing deciding to allow trans women, otherwise known as men, to fight biological women, Another trans-identified person performs a school shooting, this time in Iowa, and the UK banning the ownership of a particular breed of dangerous dog. So we're going to, we named this the, did the commies already win? That's the name of today's episode. Did the commies already win? And just to not leave you in suspense, because sometimes I'll, you know, pose a question at the beginning, and then I'll just kind of like let you linger on it, and then I'll give my, my view at the end. But I think the communists may have won. I think they may have won. They didn't need to shoot a single bullet. They didn't need to shoot a single missile. They didn't have to invade either of the coasts of the United States. They didn't have to invade the U.S. from our northern border, which is somewhat secure, and our southern border, which is completely porous. They got us to destroy ourselves. I was talking about this with somebody in Sunday school today, and it's almost like, you know, when you you have a big brother or an older brother or somebody like that, and they're making you hit yourself with your own hand, and it's like, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself. Well, eventually they can let go and you'll still kind of be hitting yourself. That's what I feel like the communists have done is they let go of our wrists a long time ago. And we're still just punching ourselves directly in the face or directly in the nuts. However, you feel like you want to think about it. Now, I've been wanting to talk about the infiltration of America with communism for a while now, but there's not always like a really soft place to land for something like that. And and again, I know for some of you that listen to the show, it's like I go from an interview with an author and then we'll have a forging table and then I'll talk about some incendiary topic and something like that. So it's kind of all over the place and can be fairly scattered. But I feel like I've come to the right point where I had enough time to kind of do some research and do some really some thinking about this because some people are hyperbolic and they always want to scream about the sky falling. And that's what a lot of people in the conservative space do. And I never wanted to be that person. But I feel like now is the time. And the signs that communism might be taking over the United States have literally been here for decades because there were times in our history where you could appoint and been, you know, the, the person saying the communists are, are trying to take us over seemed crazy. But if COVID in 2020 taught us anything, it's that remember when all the conspiracy theories were, were, oh, you're crazy if you think that, oh, you're crazy to think that COVID started in a lab in China and it was, it escaped from there somehow. You're crazy to think that. And now that is the most plausible explanation for explanation for how that virus uh, just spread across the entire globe. But this has been happening for a very, very long time. And so what I want to do today is I want to go back in our history and reveal some things to you that I think point us to the moment that we're in right now. And the first year that we're going to be starting in, you know, interestingly enough, is 1984. In that year, a man named Yuri Alexandrovich ben, uh, Bezmanov, okay, I got messed up with the middle name and I, you know, I thought it'd be good on the last name, but it's Yuri Bezmanov, let's say that. He's former KGB and he's also a Soviet defector. He defected to Canada in 1970. So he did an interview in 1984 with G. Edward Griffin and Bezmanov detailed four states of mass brainwashing used by the KGB. And so the KGB, for those of you that don't know, that was the Soviet Union's main security agency. That was their spy agency, those types of things. And they had, 
that this guy, Bezmanov, was a part of the KGB, and he knew how to perform these different tasks that would basically give us stages for how people can be brainwashed, but specifically what the Soviet Union Union was trying to do to brainwash the West and most specifically the United States. Now, the main point that he made during the interview is that Russia was planning to defeat the United States through psychological warfare. OK, they weren't going to try to invade us. They weren't going to try to you know, drop a bomb. It was going to be psychological warfare, essentially a psyop to demoralize us as a nation and as a people. That's capital N nation and capital P people. And that's the long game. So the short game is, well, we're just going to look at your border. We're going to go across it and then we're going to militarize it and then we're going to fight you. Right. That's the short game. This is the long game. This is something that takes decades and decades and decades to accomplish. You have to have dictators in place in order for this to happen. Or you can have, quote unquote, duly elected politicians like Vladimir. Um, um, oh, my gosh. Well, I mean, you've had different people. I'm trying to think of all the different people in Russia, but you've had different people that where they're put into office via an election, but the election was basically um, a foregone conclusion. So I was going to talk about Lenin a little bit, but Putin, who we have right now, this is a guy where Russia has these duly elected politicians, him being one of them, him being the main one. And yet uh, the the voting is absolutely ridiculous. It's like they it's like a dictatorial relationship, a totalitarian relationship with his populace, uh, whether they're um, they're privy to it or not. So this is the process that he described in this interview. Bezmanov described as the great brainwashing. OK, and he said the great brainwashing of the West, specifically America, would occur in four steps. So the first step is demoralization. OK, and I'll have the entire interview in the show notes so you guys can check it out. But I'm just going to kind of give you the high, high points so that we can set up what we're going to talk about. So demoralization, step one, takes 15 to 20 years. And so Bezmanov detailed that it would take time to get a new generation used to the ideas of communism. And by the time that they were fully bought into it, these same people would be in positions of power. And so the specific example that he gives in this interview is hippies from the 1960s eventually taking over important positions in government and in businesses and in organizations and universities by the 1980s, which is exactly what happened. And then Bezmanov actually thought that the process of demoralization had been completed by the time of this interview, which again was in 1984, Orwell would be so proud. But here's a quote from Bezmanov detailing what a demoralized person would be like. So here's the quote. As I mentioned before, exposure to true information does not matter anymore. A person who has demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Even if I shower him with information, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him a concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it until he receives a kick in his fan bottom. When a military boot crashes his balls, then he will understand. But not before that. That's the tragedy of the situation of demoralization. I mean, that's, that's an absolutely haunting and chilling quote. Then we have step two. Step two is destabilization. So destabilization takes two to five years. Okay, the first process took decades. This takes two to five years. And the target, uh, what they would do is they would target what would be considered the essential elements of the structure of American society. So they would be targeting the economy, foreign relations, and defense systems. Okay, so that's step two. Then we have step three, crisis. They say that this is going to take up to six weeks. And according to Bezmanov, this crisis would bring about, quote, a violent change of power, structure, and economy, unquote. Again, do I need to take you back to 2020, anyone? COVID, anyone? A violent change of power, the people that are in power. All of a sudden, people that never had power have ultimate power. Structure, we restructured our elections. We restructured our education systems. We restructured immigration. The economy, all of a sudden, it's just the big box stores that are open and all the mom and pop shops are not considered to be essential, right? And again, this says, you know, according to Bezmanov, this process, step three, crisis takes six weeks, right? Remember 15 days to slow the spread? Hardest part of the first 15 days to slow the spread is the first three years, right? That's kind of where we all live through. And then the final step is normalization. So again, just to take you through step. Step one, demoralization. Step two, destabilization. Step three, crisis. Step four, normalization. So this is step four. This is when the country and its populace accepts its new normal and forgets how things used to be before 
total ideological capture. Okay? But I'll share one more thing about this before we move on to the next thing. This is perhaps the most chilling quote of this, this entire interview. The interview is about an hour long. Again, it'll be in the show notes. Just listen to this quote. This is from Besmanov again. Most of the American politicians, media, and educational systems trains another generation of people who think they are living at the peacetime. False. United States is in a state of war, undeclared total war against the basic principles and foundations of this system. Think about that. They know that we're at war. We don't. I've heard the same thing described with uh, these fundamentalist, Islamist, terrorist groups. They're at war with us, and we don't think we're at war with them. We only think we're at war with them whenever they knock some of our buildings down, right? Whenever they chop off the heads of some people that we love or that we know. Then it's like, okay, we're at war now. It's like they've been at war with us this entire time. And so that's a very, very chilling quote. Again, that was in 1984, 40 years ago. But then we got to turn the clocks all the way back to 1965. So in 1965, Paul Harvey delivered a radio broadcast called If I Were the Devil. So Paul Harvey, he's a legendary radio broadcaster that did it from 1951 until 2008. He's an Okie. He was born in Tulsa. He was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by George W. Bush. I think that was in 2005 or something like that. But on his radio show, again, at the time was even going out to millions of people in 1965, he performed something that he wrote called If I Were the Devil. Now I'm going to play this for you. The audio isn't great, but I I do want you to listen to it closely. And I know I always encourage you guys to listen to things at two times speed. Like I always do that. And I, I definitely think that you should do that. Listen to things at two times speed, listen to podcasts, listen to books, get as much content as, and as possible. If you're one of those people, if you're like me, go back to one time speed. I want you to hear his cadence. I want you to feel the pregnant pauses. And I really want you to engage with what he's about to say. So I'm just going to lay it out there for you. So let's go to the clip. If I were the devil, if I were the devil, if I were the prince of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness. And I'd have a third of its real estate and four-fifths of its population, but I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree. The. So I'd set about, however necessary, to take over the United States. I'd subvert the churches first. I'd begin with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve. Do as you please. To the young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what's bad is good and what's good is square. And the old I would teach to pray after me, our Father, which art in Washington. And then I'd get organized. I'd educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting so that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. I'd threaten TV with dirtier movies and vice versa. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction. I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, and nations at war with themselves until each in its turn was consumed. And with promises of higher ratings, I'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flames. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects, but neglect to discipline emotions, just let those run wild. Until before you knew it, you'd have to have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. Within a decade, I'd have prisons overflowing. I'd have judges promoting pornography. Soon I could evict God from the courthouse, then from the schoolhouse, and then from the houses of Congress. And in his own churches I would substitute psychology for religion and deify science. I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbol of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give to those who wanted until I had killed the incentive of the ambitious. And what'll you bet? I couldn't get whole states to promote gambling as the way to get rich. I would caution against extremes in hard work, in patriotism, in moral conduct. I would convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned. 
that swinging is more fun, that what you see on TV is the way to be. And thus I could undress you in public, and I could lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep right on doing what he's doing. Again, guys, that was back in 1965, 59 years ago. I mean, it literally seems like that guy could have written that and performed it this year. It's almost terrifying to listen to that. It, it's really chilling, if, if we're being honest. And there's two things here. <clears throat> there's so much to talk about about this, and I could go in, go all day really just on this one particular video, but I'll be brief. There's something called primacy and recency. So back when I was doing my undergraduate degree, we did more presentations than we took exams. That was just the program that I was in, the corporate communication program that I was doing. I was also doing a leadership minor. And so I remember being taught the concept of primacy and recency. People tend to remember the first thing that they heard and experienced and the last thing that they heard and experienced. That's why you will have professional speakers have a very dramatic and kind of uh, attention grabbing thing at the beginning. And then they will end typically in a dramatic fashion as well, because they know in the middle, your mind's wandering, you know, who do you need to follow up with in your email inbox, who you're going to go to lunch with the next day, you know, what you need to do at the house. And so, but at the very beginning, you basically have their full attention. And at the very end, if you're good at it, you can kind of sense that the end is coming. And so you're leaning forward. It's like in a movie, maybe you go up, get up and use the bathroom in the middle, but you would never do that at the beginning or the end. You'll just feel like you get lost. So I want to talk about primacy and recency in terms of this Paul Harvey uh, skit or thing that he wrote. The first big point that Paul Harvey makes is this. I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree. The, and that's not T-H-E. That's T-H-E-E. And again, if he were the devil, because again, if we look at the devil and how he's depicted in Ezekiel, the devil got to a point where he was tired of, I think how uh, my pastor buddy, Joby Martin puts it, he was tired of being looked through. He wanted to be looked to. So he was the angel in heaven that was basically in charge of the concert. That, that was basically what he did. And he was tired of being looked through to God. He wanted to be looked to. And so again, the quote, I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree, the, and only God is the, we are not the, the sa Satan and his minions certainly aren't the, but God is the. So that's the primary point, right? Primacy and recency. And then the most recent point at the very end, the last big point he makes is this. In other words, if I were the devil, I just keep right on doing what he's doing. Because the thing about it is, again, this was written almost 60 years ago and delivered almost 60 years ago. And it seems like it was a plan that was put forth and has continued apace since then. So if you were the devil and you were wanting to keep as many people worshiping you, which if you worship at the altar of self, you are worshiping the devil. You don't have to, you know, perform a seance and sacrifice a cat to worship the devil. You just worship yourself. That's exactly what Satan would want you to do. And aren't all the things described in that little monologue that he delivered pointing to that end? He's doing a fantastic job. Now, again, that was in 1965. If we go back two years before that, I think Paul Harvey might have read a little bit from a guy named Cleon Skousen. So Cleon Skousen wrote something called The Naked Communist. So in 1958... OK, 1958, the FBI special agent W. Cleon Skousen penned the book The Naked Communist, and this described the history and the appeal of communism. OK, then in 1961, Skousen added the 45 goals of communism to the book The Naked Communist. And that list was so shocking, guys, that it was officially read and recorded in the 1963 congressional record by Mr. Albert S. Herlong of Florida in order to alert the public about the dangers of communism in America. Again, this is in 1963. Okay? 45 goals added, read into the congressional record in 1963. So, according to my count, because I went through the list, okay? I got the list right here as I knock everything over in my studio, okay? Got the list right here. You can see me with all my writing on it. I made a count. So according to my count, and I guess you could say my opinion, I think that 37 of these 45 goals, 37 have been achieved already, I think. I think that um, 
Six maybe have not been achieved, and there's two that I'm not sure. Actually, wait, that math doesn't really add up, does it? Yeah, 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 it does. Okay. 37 have been achieved, 37 of the 45. Add six that I do not think have been achieved, and then two that I'm not sure. Hopefully that's 45. I think that's 45. But here's one thing about the list. Um, actually, you know what I'm going to do? I was going to read the whole list and then go back, so I won't make you uh, sit through me reading out loud that long. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the things from this list of 45 that I do not think have been achieved yet and perhaps even are not even being fought for yet. And then I'm going to read the two that I'm not sure about. And then we're going to dig into the ones that I think communism has already accomplished. Okay, so here's the list of the ones, the six that I think have not been achieved yet. And I'll, I'll read them according to their number on the list. Number three, develop the illusion that total disarmament by the United States would be a demonstration of moral strength. I don't think they're even trying for that anymore. Number eight, set up East and West Germany as separate states in spite of Khrushchev's promise in 1955 to settle the German question by free elections under the supervision of the U.N. Obviously, the Berlin Wall came down. Germany is unified. That's no longer a goal. Number nine, prolong the conferences to ban atomic tests because the United States has agreed to suspend tests as long as negotiations are in progress. I don't think the United States ever bought into that. Number 13, do away with all loyalty oaths. So a loyalty oath is where you swear allegiance and loyalty to your country, even though that seemingly doesn't mean a whole lot anymore. Those still do exist. So that has not been accomplished. Number 33, eliminate all laws or procedures which interfere with the operation of the communist apparatus. Again, some of those laws and procedures have been eliminated, but certainly not all of them. Then we have number 43, the last one that I do not think has been accomplished. Overthrow all colonial governments before native populations are ready for self-government. Obviously, that's almost an impossible task. That's not going on. And then there's two that I'm really not sure about. Uh, I couldn't find any evidence or corroboration about these, and so I'm just going to leave them on the maybe list. They could go either way. Number five, extension of long-term loans to Russia and Soviet satellites. Couldn't find anything to uh, substantiate or corroborate that. And then number 45, repeal the Connolly Reservation so the United States cannot prevent the World Court from seizing jurisdiction over domestic problems. Give the World Court jurisdiction over nations and individuals alike. So I found stuff, some stuff on the Connolly Reservation. I couldn't really feel see anything that had been repealed. But those are the eight that are somewhere between I don't know and definitely not. Okay, But here are the ones in the 45 that I think it is very clear to prove have been accomplished. Again, these were written back in 1961. These were added to the book that was written in 1958 and then read into the congressional record in 1963. Here are the ones that I think the communists have accomplished. Number one, U.S. acceptance of coexistence as the only alternative to atomic war. Number two, U.S. willingness to capitulate in preference to engaging in atomic war. Number four, Permit free trade between all nations, regardless of communist affiliation and regardless of whether or not items could be used for war. Number six, provide American aid to all nations, regardless of communist domi or domination. Number seven, grant recognition of Red China, admission of Red China to the U.N. Number 10, allow all Soviet satellites, uh, satellites individual representation in the U.N. Number 11, promote the U.N. as the only hope for mankind. If its charter is rewritten, demand that it be set up as a one world government with its own independent armed forces. Some communist leaders believe the world can be taken over as easily by the U.N. as by Moscow. Sometimes these two centers compete with each other as they are now doing in the Congo. Again, this was written back then. Excuse me. Number 12. Resist any attempt to outlaw the Communist Party. Number 14. Continue giving Russia access to the U.S. Patent Office. Number 15. Capture one or both of the political parties in the United States. Obviously, they've captured the Democratic Party. Number 16, use technical decisions of the courts to weaken basic American institutions by claiming their activities violate civil rights. Number 17, get control of the schools. Use them as transmission belts for socialism and current communist propaganda. Soften the curriculum, get control of the teachers' associations, put the party line in textbooks. Number 18, gain control of all student newspapers. Number 19, use student riots to foment public protests against programs or organizations which are under communist attack. Number 20, infiltrate the press. Get control of book review assignments, editorial writing, policymaking positions. Number 21, gain control of key positions in radio, TV, and motion pictures. 22, continue discrediting American culture by degrading all forms of artistic expression. An American communist cell was told to eliminate all good sculpture from park 
parks and buildings, substitute shapeless, awkward, and meaningless forms. Number 23, control art critics and directors of art museums. Our plan is to promote ugliness, repulsive, meaningless art. Number 24, eliminate all laws governing obscenity by calling them censorship and a violation of free speech and free press. And with some of these, the language of all and forever and never, again, we're looking at for the most part, right? So if you're being super binary with all these, you're going to have a different count. This is just my count. Number 25, break down cultural standards and morality by promoting pornography and obscenity in books, magazines, motion pictures, radio, and TV. Number 26, present homosexuality, degeneracy, and promiscuity as normal, natural, and healthy. Number 27, infiltrate the churches and replace revealed religion with social religion. Discredit the Bible and emphasize the need for intellectual maturity, which does not need a religious crutch. Number 28, eliminate prayer or any, fa or any phase of religious expression in the schools on the grounds that it violates the principle of separation of church and state. Number 29, discredit the American Constitution by calling it inadequate, old-fashioned, out of step with modern needs, a hindrance to cooperation between nations on a worldwide basis. Number 30, discredit the American founding fathers, present them as selfish aristocrats who had no concern for the common man. Number 31, belittle all forms of American culture and discourage the teaching of American history on the grounds that it was only a minor part of the big picture. Give more emphasis to Russian history since the communists took over. Number 32, Support any socialist movement to give centralized control over any part of the culture, education, social agencies, welfare programs, mental health clinics, etc. Number 34. Eliminate the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Number 35. Discredit the eventual, the eventually, sorry, discredit and eventually dismantle the FBI. So they haven't dismantled the FBI, but they've certainly discredited it. Number 36. Infiltrate and gain control of more unions. Number 37, infiltrate and gain control of big business. 38, transfer some of the power powers of arrest from the police to social agencies. Treat all behavioral problems as psychiatric disorders, which no one but psychiatrists can understand or treat. Number 39, dominate the psychiatric profession and use mental health laws as a means to gain coercive control over those who oppose communist goals. Number 40, discredit the family as an institution, encourage promiscuity, and easy divorce. Number 41, emphasize the need to raise children away from the negative influence of parents, attribute prejudices, mental blocks, and retarding of children to suppressive influences of parents. Number 42, create the impression that violence and insurrection are legitimate aspects of American tradition, that students and special interest groups should rise up and use united force to solve economic, political, or social problems. And number 44, internationalize the Panama Canal. Now, as I read through that list, were some of y'all going through the headlines in your head? Because I was. I've been doing this show since 2017. We're well over 500 episodes on at this point, marching to 600. I've been living in the news cycle. I can basically think of all the ones I put on my yes list. I can think of just things that have happened since 2017 that I think would fit into those goals from communism. Now, so what do I lean more towards, you know, is the fact that I think, well, I'll put it this way. The reason why I lean more towards the fact that communism has already won and specifically in America, I want to go back and prove that with things from that list. OK, so I'm going to grab a few of these from the list so that I can defend my position that, hey, I think the communists have already won here. So let's go back to number 17. Get control of the schools, use them as transmission belts for socialism and current communist propaganda, soften the curriculum, get control of teachers associations, and put party line in textbooks. So here's the reality. We are actively making ourselves dumber. We are doing that. So going back to that, that list from number 17, soften the curriculum. Check. Some schools don't even give out grades anymore in the United States. Some schools give out A's so easily that a lot of universities and colleges don't look at GPA for admissions anymore. And speaking of universities and colleges, did you know that 80%, that's 80, 80% of universities and colleges in the United States no longer require an ACT or SAT test score to be admitted? Now, I don't think your entire future of your education should be determined by what you score on the ACT or SAT. But to not require it at all? No one told these schools to do that. They just did it. 
Some of them did it because of COVID, because access to testing centers for the ACT and SAT became very difficult. But most of them have just kept that going. It's 2024 now. And also they mentioned getting control of the teachers unions and teachers associations. Check. They've absolutely got those. The ideological capture of those organizations is prominent, again, proven very much so in 2020. And then put the party line in textbooks. Check. Seriously, just think about this. Where do you think middle schoolers and high schoolers get the idea that, well, you know, communism and socialism, it just hasn't been done right yet. Where do you think they got that idea? From their teachers that come from these teachers unions that have been ideologically captured by communism and by things that are covered and not covered in their books. What I mean by not covered is you can do this yourself. I promise you it'll work. Find somebody that's currently in college in your area. So maybe go to a coffee shop or, or talk to someone that you know at church or something like that and ask them to describe to you the Soviet gulags. They may have no idea what you're talking about. Soviet gulags, like, what? what is that? Well, what Soviet gulags? You mean like right now? Wait, is that like a, a new song from Drake? Like, they're going to say something stupid back to you. And if you really want to blow your mind, ask them to describe to you what happened during the Holocaust. Because there are kids in college right now that have never heard of it. You think I'm lying? You think I'm playing around? No. There are kids that are not being taught that millions and millions of Jews were killed by the Nazi party and where that ideology comes from. They're not being taught about Chairman Mao and the tens of millions that died under his rule in China. They're not talking about Lenin or Stalin in the Soviet Union. They're not talking about any of that. They don't have any idea. It's not in their textbooks, but the party line is. Now, let's go back to these two. I'm going to read 20 and 21 again. Infiltrate the press. Get control of book review assignments, editorial writing, and policy positions. That's number 20. Number 21, gain control of key positions in radio, TV, and motion pictures. So the reality with these two combined is no matter where you go for your news or your information or your entertainment, we, your moral superiors, will be there to control and mold you via the content we thrust your way. Now we do that algorithmically, right? Because these people, they control capital T truth with the news, but then they also control perceptions of capital T truth with entertainment. So if you just look at it in terms of representation, depending upon the stats you see, somewhere between 2 and 7% of the United States population identifies as LGBTQ, right? Whatever the heck that means, whatever that means today because of the plus on the end. But when you watch shows, it's more like 25% of the characters are gay or lesbian or questioning or trans. And that's even being injected into children's shows. Thank you, Disney. Again, parents, why are you supporting that company? What's wrong with you? But think about that. They're controlling perceptions of truth and truth. Then let's read 25 and 26 again. Here's 25. Break down cultural standards of morality by promoting pornography and obscenity in books, magazines, motion pictures, radio, and TV. And number 26, present homosexuality, degeneracy, and promiscuity as normal, natural, and healthy. So here's the reality on that one. Whatever God says is depraved and abominable behavior or content, we, your moral superiors, will hold those things up as a paragon of virtue and true identity. Homosexuality is not, not an abominable sin. It's just who you are. Lady Gaga said it's just, it's just how you were made, right? You were born this way, right? And most of you have heard by now about the pornographic books that are in your children's middle and high school libraries where it graphically depicts homosexual sex, rape, sodomy. And then you have people like, what? What's the problem? Why are you being such a prude? Right? It becomes a major issue. Then let's read 27 and 28 together. Infiltrate the churches and replace revealed religion with social religion. Discredit the Bible and emphasize the need for intellectual maturity, which does not need a religious crutch. Right? When's the last time you heard, oh, you're just, that's a crutch that you need because you're so weak-minded. Right? And then 28, eliminate prayer or any phase of religious expression in the schools on the grounds that it violates the principles of separation of church and state. Again, dummies think the separation of church and state is either in the U.S. Constitution, in the Bill of Rights, or in the Declaration of Independence. It's none of those places. It was in a private letter written by Thomas Jefferson, and the whole concept that he was describing was not keeping the church out of the state. It was keeping the state out of the church. Okay, that's the quick and dirty explanation of that. But here's the reality on 27 and 28. We have 
evolved and progressed so much as humans that we no longer need antiquated and small-minded practices like going to church and reading our Bible or praying or any of those types of things, right? That's what they've accomplished. And then we'll read 29 and 20 and 29 and 30 together. Discredit the American Constitution by calling it inadequate, old-fashioned, out of step with modern needs, a hindrance to cooperation between nations on a worldwide basis. Number 30, discredit the American founding fathers, present them as selfish aristocrats who had no concern for the common man. And so here's their reality. When I keep saying reality, I'm talking about their reality. They far exceeded their goals with 29 and 30, okay? The American Constitution is seen as a relic of a racist and patriarchal past, right? That's why people are so easily like, yeah, let's just get out the red marker and and upgrade and update this thing, right? And the American founding fathers are seen as the cornerstones of the racist patriarchy. That's what we see. Again, I remember when Trump was saying, hey, they're coming for Confederate statues now. They're eventually going to come for Washington and Lincoln and Roosevelt and Jefferson. They're coming for all of them. Oh, you're crazy. Oh, you're just saying stupid things on Twitter. Oh, you're orange Satan. Except he's right. There have been statues taken down of all those people that I just described. All of them. So with all that in mind, some of you, maybe your head's been spinning for the last 30 minutes or so because it's like, man, this is so much. Like, I can't believe they were talking about this back in the 80s. I can't believe they were talking about this back in the 1960s. I can't believe some of these things were written in the 1950s. How did we get here? But here's my main point. My main point out of all these things, because I could go down every rabbit hole with this, but I have to keep it brief. The communists have been so successful at doing all of this that no one has even noticed that they didn't technically do it to us. They've convinced us to do it to ourselves. So I described earlier with somebody making you hit yourself with your hand and then finally they let go and you're just still sitting there punching yourself in the face or the nuts. Right? They didn't do this to us. They convinced us to destroy our own country from within because geographically, the United States is a hard country to overtake, right? Because we have an enormous ocean to our west and an enormous ocean to our east. We're going to see you coming, right? And we, as of right now, have friendly members, friendly nations to our north and to our south, right? They're at least not nations that will join in a fight against us right now with Canada and Mexico. So it's going to be very, very hard to just pull up via the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean or via Canada or Mexico and try and take us out. The only way to do it is to rot us from within. And they've done that slowly but surely. Think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, which comes right off of the satanic teat of communism, right? DEI is leading to worse companies because you have companies that are hiring people because they look a certain way, not because they can perform in a certain way, right? How about worse schools? We just saw this with Claudine Gay at Harvard. Again, you know, all the anti-Semitic stuff notwithstanding. She was a deeply unimpressive academic that was ascended to the position of president of the most famous university and uh, educational institution on the planet with basically no credentials. She was the worst credentialed president in the history of Harvard. And she got the job. Why? Two things. She was black and she was a woman. That was it. How did putting her as the university president make Harvard a better academic institution? It didn't. Let's talk about airlines. I've seen a lot of this recently. A lot of these airlines have gone out of their way to make sure that there's not any more of those dirty, rotten, white men pilots, right? The, these airlines have stopped caring about, do you want to do this job? Are you capable of doing this job? Are you trained to do this job? Do you have the demeanor to do this job? They want you to look a certain way. So Southwest Airlines is going to post a picture of an all-female flight crew, not just flight attendants, but the pilots as well. And then you have these other organizations that are saying, well, there's not enough black women pilots. When a little black girl sees a pilot, she never sees someone that looks like her. That's important. We're going to make sure more of those people are pilots. And I'll just tell you right up front, I could give a care less who my pilot is in terms of what they look like. I don't care how tall or short they are, what color hair they have, what background they have, what religion they are. I could give a care less about any of that. What I care about is when we take off, that we land where we're supposed to. And the pilot has the most impact on that outcome. 
Yes, something could go wrong with a plane. An engine could blow off. You could have a goose fly into the engine. All things could happen, right? But in terms of takeoff, flying, and landing, that pilot is in almost complete control of their life, their co-pilot's life, and everybody else on board. So if that ends up being a black woman, great, as long as I get to my destination safely. If that ends up being an old, white, conservative Christian man, great, makes no difference to me. But these companies are not looking for uh, ability anymore. They're not looking for competency. They're looking for immutable characteristics. And so with all this, what's the point? Because I think God is still in control. I think even if the communists did take over, even if we were attacked from the Pacific side by the Chinese, even if we were invaded, even if we were conquered, America might fall. But Jesus is still real. Because I know people right now that live in America, and I also know that there are people right now that are living under the boot of communism that have put their faith in Christ for salvation, and they've repented of their sins, and they will spend eternity in glory. That's the ultimate point. A secondary point is we should push back against these ideologies when we see them creeping into our area. Go back to how to avoid being a crappy man in 2024, those 17 things. One thing was, you know, pay attention and get involved locally, right? Because it's really hard for you in Godibo, Oklahoma, or Bangor, Maine, or who's it's what's it, Idaho, to affect something on a national or international scale. You can vote for your senator. You can vote for president. You can vote for your state house and senate. You can vote for mayor. You can vote for dog catcher. You can vote for city council. You can vote for school board. Those are things that you can vote for. But not all those are created equal in terms of your impact. So your vote for president doesn't count nearly as much to you and your local community as your vote for mayor. Do you know who your mayor is? Any idea who your mayor is? So if you see communism and some of the things that I've described today creeping into your school system or your community or your church, it's up to you to push back that darkness. It's up to you. Hey guys, real quick, as you've likely heard me talk about on the show before, it took me forever before I started taking supplements of any kind. I was always nervous about taking like whey protein and creatine or really anything beyond that because I was just afraid of what was in the product and if it was going to like give me cancer someday or something like that. And I was always scared of these companies, these supplement companies, just cutting corners and using low quality products and eventually putting things in their products that could cause problems for me and my body. So I've always wanted to partner up with an American company that uses high quality quality ingredients in their supplements. And that's why I want to remind you guys that we are partnered with Jocko Fuel. So Jocko Fuel is Jocko Willink's American-based supplement company. So what are some of my favorite products that they make that I also use? They have the best tasting greens powder on the market. I love the peach flavor myself. They also make whey protein powder. The banana cream is my favorite. They make energy drinks. The Jocko Go energy drinks. My favorite is currently a tie between their iced tea lemonade and their pink lemonade flavors. I also use their creel oil, their creatine, their vitamin D, and also their sleep aids. And they make a bunch of other stuff like ready to drink protein, protein cookies, which are actually really delicious. My boys even like them. Pre-workout powder and much, much more. Guys, If you take your health and wellness seriously, then you've got to put high quality products in your body. Try Jocko Fuel out today by going to www.jockofuel.com. That's jockofuel.com. Use the promo code undaunted to get 10% off of your order. Again, that's jockofuel.com. Promo code undaunted to get 10% off of your order. So as we come out of that commercial break, here's some product placement for those of you watching on YouTube. I just took a sip of Jocko Go. Now, I did want to point out something about this particular Jocko Go. This is the pineapple coconut. I would never have ordered this in a million years, ever. But the amazing and wonderful people at Jocko Fuel sent me a case of each of the different Go drinks so that I could try them all. And when I had this, I don't know why. I was like, okay, finally, I got to try them all because I hate coconut. I can't stand the texture of coconut. The taste isn't much better. But for whatever reason, this pineapple coconut is actually fantastic. So for you pina colada people out there, this is a great one. Uh, my favorite probably is still either the iced tea lemonade, blue raspberries, awesome. Orange is awesome. Uh, what else? Pink lemonade. That's probably one of our favorites here around here. So there you go. There's my commercial for that. But now we got some more business to tend to. Let's get to the quick hitters. Number one, 
The Biden administration doing everything they can to keep the U.S. southern border open while simultaneously claiming that it's completely secure. So this is according to CNN. The Biden administration on Wednesday, this was a couple Wednesdays ago, filed a lawsuit against Texas over its controversial immigration law that gives local law enforcement in Texas the authority to arrest migrants, arguing the state cannot run its own immigration system. The move comes after the Justice Department threatened last week to sue Texas if it didn't back down from this measure. It marks the second legal action against the state this week. Again, this was a couple of weeks ago as President Joe Biden and Texas Governor Greg Abbott spar over the handling of the U.S.-Mexico border. And then we saw, guys, uh, I think it was last week, New York City, there was the story of migrants, again, because Governor Abbott of Texas and Governor DeSantis of Florida and others are busing and flying these migrants into these supposedly sanctuary cities. And they're basically telling these people like, OK, well, hey, you want to be a sanctuary? Well, here's the people that need sanctuary. And they actually kicked kids out of a public school in New York City for a day so that they could hi- house these illegal immigrants. So that they could sleep in the gym, sleep in the hallways and all this. So the kids had to go to online learning, which is essentially not learning. And they weren't able to go to school. And a lot of people freaked out. A lot of the parents freaked out, rightfully so. They pay taxes for their kids to go to that public school. These illegal immigrants have paid nothing and done nothing for this country except for take. And now they're taking away from our children's education. And there were other people that had major concerns because inside those illegal uh, immigrant, the the people that were staying inside that school, there were criminals inside of that group. Most of them, I would say, are just people that want a better life, whatever that means to them. But there were criminals. And so now the parents, they're being assured that the school would be cleaned and desanitized before their kids went back. But what about people that were potentially storing weapons or drugs or who God knows what in these schools? What if a kid finds something like that? We've heard about how lethal fentanyl is. What if one of them was a smuggler and somehow they smuggled in something that had fentanyl in it? Now you have a little kid pick up a baggie in the bathroom, smell it and then die, ingest it somehow and then die. I certainly hope that that doesn't happen, but it's very plausible as an outcome. So my big takeaway on this one is that this is a planned invasion and it will continue apace until or unless Joe Biden is removed from office and likely well after that. Because Democrats want the border to remain open so that they can get a new lawyer, loyal voter block into the country when Republicans eventually cave and grant to all illegal immigrants in the U.S. uh, amnesty. Because that's definitely going to happen. Mark my words, that will 100 percent happen. I'm not sure when, but it's essentially guaranteed that the Republicans will cave on this. But even if the Republicans don't cave, which, again, I have my doubts, the Democrats will 100 percent kill the filibuster in order to get this through at some point. I'm not saying it's going to happen this year, but there's not a bigger get than this. This is the biggest get that they can get. Because if they can just snap their fingers and turn tens of millions of people in this country into naturalized citizens that will overwhelmingly vote for them, it'll be one of the biggest boons in the history of politics on the global stage, right? And then we've seen a lot of these Democratic governors freaking out. They're in these blue states, you know, Illinois and New York and New Jersey and all these places that, you know, we're busing these illegal immigrants to. And most of them are freaking out because they're claiming that they don't have enough space or resources, which I'm sure some of that is the case. But ultimately, that's not the reason why they're freaking out. Okay, I think they're freaking out because people like DeSantis, Nabbitt and others are flooding already blue states and already blue cities with migrants that will end up voting Democrat once they are made citizens. And that wasn't part of the plan. The the forces behind this, that, you know, this evil cabal, the forces behind this, they want to flood red states and red cities, the largest of which being Texas and the cities of Texas. They want to flood those places because when the switch is flipped and all these people become citizens, It's going to make those cities turn from red to purple, if not red entirely to blue. So when these people are freaking out, like some of you think it's because, oh, they they just were completely unaware of the plight of what was happening to these small cities in Texas or New Mexico or Arizona. Some of that's true, but I think it's because this was a wrinkle in the plan. Abbott and DeSantis are outmaneuvering them. They're like, wait, we can't have that. When amnesty eventually comes, we have to make sure that Texas turns blue because guys, guess what? If Texas turns blue, the country is essentially finished, right? It could end before then. Again, we spent the first 45 minutes talking about ways the communists are trying to destroy the country. If Texas turns blue, 
it's a wrap. But just a reminder, because I've been dogging and dunking on the Democrats here and they certainly deserve it. I just want to give a reminder to all of the Trump needs to be reelected so he can shut down the border people. Let me let me give you something here. Trump was in office for four years and he didn't one build the wall two make Mexico pay for it or three shut down the border. Show me I'm wrong. Well, the illegal immigration uh, went down quite a bit. Yes, it did. It certainly went down quite a bit. Anything compared to what's happening currently with the Biden administration is an improvement. This is the worst the border has ever been, has ever been. Right. But he got elected because he was going to build the wall. He didn't build the wall. There are parts of the wall that were built, but in four years, a physical barrier on the southern border where a physical barrier could go did not go up. The places that did go up were not paid for by Mexico, another guarantee by Trump, and the border was still wide open. What's the plan? You're going to elect Donald Trump. All of a sudden, Democrats are going to stop trying to impeach him and stop trying to throw him in jail, and all of a sudden, he's going to shut down the border. Bless you if you believe that. Because here's the idea. What I think should happen is is fairly extreme. I do understand. But what I think should happen is that we militarize the border immediately and we start accepting zero asylum cases until we can figure out what is happening currently in our country. Because there is a years long backlog of people that are just waiting to hear their asylum case heard by a judge years long, two, three years long. So we have these people that are in this country. And we have no idea why they're here. And we have no idea if their asylum uh, case is even relevant. And also, it's not just people from Mexico. It's obviously a ton of people from Central and South America. Why are these people passing up other countries to come to come to America? Why can't they take asylum in Mexico or Ecuador or Venezuela or somewhere else? Brazil, why are they having to take refuge here? Again, no one's ever explained that to me. Now, if Trump is reelected or sorry, yeah, I guess it would technically be reelected just four year gap. If he's reelected, will the border get better? Yeah. Will it be shut down? No. It doesn't get shut down until we shut it down. We've seen video just in the last week of Eagle Pass. So this is actually pretty awesome. In Texas, Governor Abbott sent out the National Guard to block Eagle Pass. And so you have all this razor wire and barbed wire. And there's this one little sliver where we've all seen the videos now of illegal immigrants just streaming right through. They're just walking right through from Mexico into America. Well, the Border Patrol was sitting there with, or not Border Patrol, uh, this is the National Guard, were sitting there with riot shields pushing these people back, not letting them through. Could that have been for the cameras? Could they have eventually let all those people through? I don't know. But they have muscled the southern border where they know how. Now, is that going to shut down the cartels? Is that going to shut down the coyotes? Of course not. But is it going to stem the tide a little bit? Is it going to give us an idea? Is it going to give us the ability to wrap our minds around the 20 to 30 million people, undocumented people that are here illegally, to give us an idea of what we should do with those people before we accept one more person through the back door? I think so. So just don't think that magically electing Trump fixes this. It certainly won't. All right, next quick hitter here. The Vatican doubling down on Pope Francis's call to bless same-sex couples. So this is according to Axios. The Vatican on January the 4th defended Pope Francis's recent decision to allow priests to bless same-sex couples after bishops around the world condemned the doctrine. The Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, the church department in charge of Catholic doctrine, in a statement on Thursday, January, January the 4th, said dissent to the policy reflected a, quote, need for a more extended period of pastoral reflection, unquote. It also noted that the policy may be a delicate subject in countries that strictly outlaw homosexuality, most of those being in Africa. But such countries are few, per the department, adding that church leaders under governments with those laws have a wider responsibility to defend human dignity. However, it said dissent to the new policy cannot be described as doctrinal opposition, as the policy reaffirms the church's longstanding beliefs about marriage and sexuality. So my big takeaway on this one? Is I freaking told you so? When have you heard me say that before? Because if you go back to episode 538, way, way, way back to episode 538 of this podcast, when I did the podcast called The Pope is an Effeminate Pansy, I signaled that this was coming. And like clockwork, it happened like within a week. And then here's the thing that I was told. And some very ang- some told me very angrily, Catholics swore up and down that nothing had changed. 
that this was just an example of the mainstream media hating the Catholics and Protestants, not understanding Catholicism and everyone trying to take shots. Okay, and they were saying, well, he didn't mean it that way and it's not the way it sounds and nothing actually changed. But here's the thing. All these Catholics are defending the Pope and the Vatican by saying, well, he didn't mean it that way, only for the Vatican to come out and say, yeah, he totally meant it that way. And I told you, I freaking told you, because a day after this announcement in January, a day after, or it wouldn't have been in January, it was late last year, the very next day, a woke priest somewhere in America blessed a same-sex couple, two dudes, while they were holding hands. And if that wasn't what the Pope wanted then that guy would have been strung up, figuratively speaking. He would have been defrocked. He would have lost his flock. Nothing happened to that guy. He probably got a call from the Pope, said, great job, man. You're doing exactly what we want. Don't worry, we'll put you in the lavender mafia eventually, right? But again, going back to that article from Axios, saying that dissent to the new policy cannot be described as doctrinal opposition, that is the biggest gaslighting crock of crap ever because dissent to this new policy again it is new it is doctrinal opposition it can like it can't be taken in any other way it is opposition to the accepted doctrine of the church and again need i remind you what the definition of heresy is it's someone that holds to a belief system that is completely counter to the the overall belief system or doctrine of a particular philosophy So you cannot be a Christian pastor and say homosexuality is okay. You can't do it because that goes against the accepted doctrine of your faith, which is that that is an abominable sin. So I freaking told you this is just going to keep happening with this Pope, and I'll keep telling you that I told you so. All right, now I'm going to combine these next two stories and give you one big takeaway. I'm just going to tell you, I've not been looking forward to this section of this podcast because just thinking about it makes me incredibly furious. Um, There's very few things on this uh, world categorically that can make me shed angry tears, and it it happens with stories like this. So I'm going to read these two here. A Florida prosecutor announcing the first death penalty case for a child rapist. So this is according to Colin Rugg on Twitter. A Florida prosecutor has announced the first death penalty case for child rape after Governor, Governor DeSantis signed a measure into law allowing child rapists to be put to death. Joseph Andrew Giampa filmed a video of him forcing a child under 12 to perform a sex act on him before he forced himself on the child. Thanks to DeSantis' new law, Giampa may be put to death and the 5th Judicial Circuit Court attorney Bill Gladstone wants to make sure it happens. The death penalty reflects the gravity of the charges and the state attorney's office dedication to holding criminals accountable for their actions. Our commitment to ensuring justice and protecting the vulnerable remains unwavering. So just quick thing before I read the next thing. DeSantis is just a winner. He's just a winner that keeps on winning. He wins legislatively. He's not winning on Twitter or on his own made-up social media app, but he just keeps winning on the stuff that actually matters, which is legislation. He almost never makes a misstep on legislation. But I guess, you know, Trump is God, so apparently we don't get to uh, be a fan of Ron DeSantis, the best governor in in the country. But let's go to the next story here. Seven men in Texas being arrested for gang-raping two toddlers in a mall bathroom. According to Business Pack Review, a former Houston Galleria shopping mall employee reportedly filmed himself and six other men gang raping two male toddlers at the mall. The 29 year old suspect, Arthur Hector Fernandez III, then uploaded the content to the dark web, where investigators with the Australian Center of Counter and Child Exploitation, the ACCCE, later discovered it. The ACCCE then handed the content over to the FBI, who subsequently were able to identify Fernandez through relatives of the two male toddlers who identified the clothes and children the children were wearing and sanitized images from the videos, according to state. KRIV. The relatives who helped bus Fernandez were also the same ones who had handed their children over to him in the first place. A relative of the first toddler said they'd been called into work on a scheduled day off, leaving them scrambling to find a babysitter, the messenger has confirmed. They took the child to work where Fernandez allegedly offered to watch them. And they have evidently agreed for reasons that remain unclear. Same with the second child. A relative of the second toddler said that they were in a similar predicament when they brought their child to work. Fernandez allegedly said he'd babysit the child, walking them around the mall and watching over them, the messenger notes. The victims are reportedly aged two and three. One of the explicit videos uploaded to the dark web shows one of the boys on a changing table being assaulted as Fernandez records. 
So these two and three year old boys were sodomized by these seven pieces of absolute human debris. So here's my big takeaway on both stories. All convicted child rapists should be castrated and then publicly executed. What's the downside of doing this? Now, some people, when I post these videos and, 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 you know, stories and stuff like that online, they're like, you know, they start freaking out. They're like, wait, these people haven't even been convicted, convicted yet. Yeah. But if they are convicted, so let's take this scenario. Let's take the ringleader of these, these seven rapists or whatever, um, inside the mall. If he's found guilty, which there's video evidence of him sodomizing these young boys, right? Destroying their insides physically and spiritually, probably right. And mentally, certainly let's say he's found guilty by a jury of his peers. I grant him one appeal that begins the next day. And if his original conviction is upheld, he is executed at dawn the next morning or the next day. And the public gets to watch. The public is not forced to watch, but they'll get to watch. What's the downside? Death by hanging in the public square? What, have we evolved past that? Don't you think that one of these depraved, satanic individuals that would do that to a child might think twice if they're like, well, I'm going to be castrated and then hung naked in the public square? Have we become too decent for that? Are we too progressive for those things now? <clears throat> because I'm all for what we can do to stop these things from happening. <coughs> And one of the ways you stop these things from happening is you punish the people that we catch doing it in the most extreme ways possible. That's not cruel and unusual. What they did to these boys is cruel and unusual, right? All these stories that we hear, those are things that are cruel and unusual. There's another story, not a sexual assault, but there was a guy who had a kid with his, you know, ex-wife or whatever. Well, he has his kids... Or his young daughter, his daughter was like nine months old or something like that. And this guy's girlfriend, his then girlfriend was watching the baby. That girlfriend fed the baby batteries and screws trying to kill it. And she did. She did. Now, she didn't rape the kid. So, you know, castration doesn't really come into play here. But why not execute her publicly? Let the, let the public see it. Why do we sanitize execution? Why do we have it behind closed doors? Why do we lethally inject these people so that they just go to sleep and never come back? Why do we extend them any form of decency? Some of you might be like, Kyle, this is very aggressive. And where's all the grace? Because we're supposed to be graceful and forgiveness and all that. Fine. You can be forgiven by God and still suffer the consequences of man. When I went and spoke at Lewisburg, a lot of those men have put their faith in Christ for the propitiation of their sins, and they've repented from their old ways. That doesn't mean they get out of prison. Because the people they murdered are still murdered. The people they raped are still raped. The children that they abused sexually are still abused sexually. And they have to pay. The wages of those sins in terms of this world should be exactly what I described. For these men, for men like them, castration, public execution. Full stop. All right, next quick hitter here, USA Boxing deciding to allow trans women, a.k.a. men, to fight biological women. So this is according to NBC News. Boxing's highest national governing body added a transgender athlete's policy to its rule book that requires genital reassignment surgery and stringent hormone testing before competition, making it among the strictest policies for trans athletes. The guidelines dated August of 2022 excuse me, and released as part of the USA Boxing's 2024 rule book on Friday, are facing criticism for including trans women at all, bucking a recent streak of sports governing body decisions that have excluded trans women entirely if they have undergone male pu puberty. The policy states that minors under the age of 18 must compete as their birth gender in weight classes outlined in the rule book. Transgender women over 18 can only compete in the female category if they undergo genital reassignment surgery and submit quarterly hormone tests for at least four years following the surgery. The guidelines, which define normal ranges of testosterone as less than 3.1 nanomoles per liter for women and more than 10 nanomoles per liter for men, mandate transgender women demonstrate that their total testosterone serum level has been below 5 nanomoles per liter for at least four years prior to their first competition and throughout the time they desire to be eligible to compete. 
So a few things to point out, point out here about this ridiculous story. The first is obvious to anyone with a functioning brain. Men can't become women and vice versa. There's no such thing as a transgender person. That means you're outside of gender. That's not real. Obviously, you morons. Other things. Most of the left-wing coverage of this story thought it was great for two reasons. Number one, they saw this announcement as the installation of a strict ban on transgender athletes. They thought that this was like a strict thing, like all these things are very strict. We'll talk more about that in a second. But number two, these stories upheld that, in fact, men could become women. And side note, the leftist media is finding it more and more difficult to support both feminism and transgenderism because these two things do not mesh well at all. And I just think it's delicious. I'm here for it. But they're saying that a transgender woman, a man, has to maintain a level of five nanomoles per liter of total testosterone to be able to compete, right? Or maintain a level below that. That is still almost twice as much testosterone as a normal biological female. Because normal biological female is going to be somewhere between, you know, 2.0 and 3.1 nanomoles per liter of natural total testosterone. So with that, if a biological female boxer were to test in that five-ish nanomoles per liter of total testosterone, they would be banned from fighting because it would be clear that they would be doping. And these tests are so easy to get around. So you're telling me that once a quarter, once every 90-ish days, they go and get tested and they have to test below a certain level? Do they know anything about doping? Back in the, you know, A-Rod days, he would take a testosterone gummy that would be out of his system before the game was over. So he would get a testosterone boost for, you know, two and a half, three hours, and it would be out of his system by the time he would potentially have to go piss in a cup right after a game because they weren't going to make him do it during the game, and he knew that. So you're telling me that if these people know (laughs) that they're only going to be tested once a quarter, four times a year, that they're not going to find a way to get around those tests? But most importantly, all that's important, but this is most important. These transgender women fighters, a.k.a. male fighters, they will forever have the tremendous physical advantages of going through a full male puberty, regardless of if they cut off their junk or inject poison into their bodies to bring their T levels down. It'll forever be that way. It doesn't matter what they do to themselves. They will ever have that advantage. They will have the advantage of bigger hearts, higher VO2 max, bigger and stronger bones, bigger and stronger ligaments, more muscle tissue overall, stronger muscle tissue overall, overall, superior endurance, on and on and on and on. They will always have that. So my big takeaway on this story is regardless of all of the distracting language in the reporting of a story like this, this is the reality of the story. USA Boxing is okay with men fighting women. They're okay with that. Ergo, they're okay with men beating up women. Because they're incredibly skilled skilled female fighters that would still get beat up by just a regular run-of-the-mill man off the street because of all the things I talked about earlier. Bigger hearts, higher VO2 max, bigger and stronger bones, bigger and stronger ligaments, more muscle tissue, stronger muscle tissue, superior endurance, all things that have a lot to do with a sport like boxing that requires speed, strength, endurance. And USA Boxing is totally cool with it. So, if anyone from USA Boxing is listening to this, which I'm sure at some point you turned this off if you were, why not just combine all of USA Boxing into one category? Get rid of the distinctions of male and female, because guess what? If you get rid of gender entirely, then it doesn't matter if you're female, male, transgender, non-binary, like fluffy gender, whatever thing that is going to be made up next, just get rid of all of it and say... This is the 130-pound division or whatever kilos that they they put them in. This is 130 pounds. All human beings can compete. Even though that's speciesist, why can't a grizzly bear compete for USA Boxing, you bigots? But let's just say all humans can compete and let them compete. And watch these women get their orbital bones broken to get to suffer egregiously awful concussions. And you will obviously experience a woman dying in the ring at the hands of a male fighter. Now, I would assume if USA Boxing were to do that, you're going to have a whole spate of male boxers. I would say the overwhelming majority of them that will say, no, I'm not boxing a woman. I don't care what you call them. I don't care what they call themselves. I'm not putting my hands on a woman. Because if you're a boxer 
and you're boxing for a spot on the Olympic team, you know how to throw hands. Like at a minimum, you know how to throw hands. And so that person is going to mess up a girl, a, a, a young woman, in such an unbelievable fashion that it will be preposterous. And for any of you people out there that don't believe me, go watch videos of the best female boxers on the planet who you don't know their names anyway because nobody watches women's boxing, but the best female boxers on the planet sparring with men because they're getting dudes that don't even have amateur fights. These are just dudes that like to train and they're out there and they're just busting them up. It's because they're different. That doesn't mean men are better like at, at being human. It means they're better at being a boxer. It means they're built to be better at that. In USA Boxing, yeah, they just can't be bothered to come up with a better policy than this. All right, next quick hitter here. Another trans-identified person performs a school shooting, this time in Iowa. So this is according to the Post Millennial. The suspect behind the Perry High School shooting has been reportedly identified as Senior Dylan Butler, local outlet WHO 13 reports. Police confirmed the shooter's identity. While several uh, were injured, one boy, a sixth grader, was killed. The shooting took place in the morning prior to the start of the school day during a breakfast program. The shooting in the Iowa school uh, was around 25 miles northwest of Des Moines. Iowa saw three people injured, including school principal Dan Marburger, who was rushed into surgery. The shooter appeared to have died as a result of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Butler allegedly had a TikTok account where he went by the username took too much. The student's last post was him inside a bathroom stall with a duffel bag on the ground next to him. The still uh, video features the words, now we wait, with a song called Stray Bullets playing. Police are investigating these assets. The account, which has since been wiped by TikTok, featured an anime girl as the avatar, with the biography only featuring the gay pride flag and identifying as DJ. Other videos on the account include Butler ta talking about getting faded on Christmas or getting high, having a pretend gunfight on the school playground with another person, and smoking weed with a group. In one photo posted as part of a group, Butler posted, Bro, Though I was sharing my Gatorade, he's mad, accompanying with trans flag emojis as well as the hashtag gender fluid. Another account called Dylan Say What shows the pronouns he, they. So this is just the latest story in a trend of mentally ill people that identify as trans or non-binary performing mass shootings. If you'll remember, we still haven't seen the entire manifesto of the Nashville school shooter, um, but we know that if it was a white kid, that had targeted a black school just so that he could kill black people, it would still be front page news today. We would, we would never be able to get past that story. But my big takeaway on this story and all the other stories like it is when you constantly tell mentally ill children and adults that they are victims, they are, that they are actually the identity that they claim and that they are being genocided, we can't be shocked when they act out in violent and murderous ways. Now, I'm not saying that these people are responsible, but they're certain create, certainly creating the witch's brew where people like this that have such mental issues that not only do they think they're the opposite gender or that they're gender fluid, but that they think the only way out of this life, the only way that I can express myself and be heard is by killing a bunch of people and then killing myself, which is typically how this goes. Luckily, the Nashville shooter was killed by law enforcement before they could kill anybody else, right? So that was at least some justice or before they could even kill themselves. But that's the problem that we see with things like this, is these people clearly have mental illness. All mass shooters do. Some of them extreme mental illness. But we're tut-tutting these people's mental illness. Where we're like, oh no, you are gender fluid. You just keep f trying to explore yourself. And not only that, but all morality is relative. So whatever morality you feel right now is right for you. And, you know, standpoint epistemology is perfect. So whatever your immutable characteristics you are. And by the way, if you're gay or, or trans or whatever, that's immutable. That can't be changed. That certainly can't be redecided on. And we just keep telling them these things. Why would we be shocked that we're continuing to see more of this? Then this goes to a larger discussion. When you see a school shooting like this, the, again, why does TikTok automatically wipe the account? Why are all these leftists coming out that like, constantly want to talk about Black Lives Matter and you know trans lives matter and you know, trans people are being genocided? All they want to do is talk about the firearm. That's all they want to do. They want to talk about the firearms used. And they don't want to talk about anything else that could have led to that firearm being used because, again, a weapon is just that. It's a weapon. So this knife right here is a weapon, but if I just set it right here in front of me, and no one ever picks it up. This this knife can never be used to kill anybody or hurt anybody. It's just going to sit right here. Same thing when you go back to the debate I did on Justin Brierley's show, 
where I loaded an AR, ran the bolt, and put it on safe and set it down in front of me. And I was like, all right, well, let's see if this thing jump, jumps up and shoots anybody while we're talking today. Again, it's not the the tool used in the evil. It's the person that grabs the tool and uses it for evil. But they can't be bothered to be thinking about that. They can't be bothered to be thinking about how other factors could have led to that. Because one thing we don't know about the shooter, I don't know if his dad was around and present in his life, but I would take a guess that he probably wasn't. I, I could probably take a guess that his family didn't go to church, that this young man hadn't had the gospel shared with him. And if he had, he just, just something that he didn't take seriously, right? But we're not allowed about to talk about any of those other factors. But guys, it's it's unfortunate, but don't be surprised if we continue seeing shootings just like this from people just like that. All right, last quick hitter here before we let you go. The UK banning the ownership of a particular breed of dangerous dogs. So this is according to the BBC. American Bully XL dogs are to be banned by the UK by the end of 2023. I think that did actually go through. The country's Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has announced. It comes after a man in England died following what Mr. Sunak described as another suspected XL bully attack on Thursday. It was the latest in a series of deadly incidents. Mr. Sunak said that he ordered work to legally... He ordered work to legally define the breed being the recent attacks or behind the recent attacks so it can be banned under the Dangerous Dogs Act, which applies in England, Wales, and Scotland. So here's my big takeaway on this one. This is one of the few times where government overreach is actually to the redounding benefit of the populace. So go back to episode 377 of this podcast. So in that episode, I talked about a lot of different things. But in one of those episodes, I talked about how I'm basically against the private ownership of pit bulls. So to hit the high points again, you have to go back. It's episode 377. I forget how far into it it is. It was a while ago now. But every year in the United States, of all the people that are killed by dogs, again, every year, over half of those dog attack fatalities come from one single type of dog, and that's the pit bull. And inside of that type of dog is also the American XO bully. So even though that type of dog makes up less than 6% of the dog population. It's well over half of those fatalities come from that breed. Pit bulls were literally bred to grasp animals with their jaws, usually the neck or the face, and to hang on until that victim or the other animal suffocates. The victims are almost always elderly women and small children. Yes, this includes pit bulls that have been family pets for years. Plenty of stories of pit bulls that were raised from the time that they were puppies, that they're, you know, six, seven, eight years old. And then one day they snap, they kill the babies, they almost kill mom, and the dad comes home and has to end up killing the dog or forcing it into the backyard. There's plenty of those stories. In my opinion, pit bulls should be seen as wild animals, not house pets. Again, go to episode 377 and listen, uh, because I debunk the most common objections that some of you are thinking to yourself right now. I debunk all these. It's a problem with the owners, not the breed. Uh, there are millions of dog bites recorded every year, and a lot of those come from small breed dogs. The breed isn't aggressive. They're just misunderstood. You've never owned a pit bull, so what do you know? It's just like owning a gun. If you don't want a pit bull, then don't own a pit bull. Uh, I've only ever been around nice and gentle pit bulls, or only a small percentage of people die from dog attacks anyway. You're just being emotional about this one. Whatever. Ultimately, I personally am for bands like this, like what the UK is doing, and I wish that it would take place in the United States across the board. So pit bulls are already banned on all military bases in the U.S. They're also banned in parts of the following states. Iowa, Kentucky, Ohio, Kansas, Missouri, Wisconsin, Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, Georgia, Alabama, North Dakota, Tennessee, Florida, and Indiana. Many home and renters insurance companies won't cover you if you own a pit bull or, a, or they will significantly jack up your premiums. Pit bulls are banned in tons of HOAs. And guess what, guys? It's not because of news coverage of pit bulls. You morons think that, oh, well, pit bulls are just misunderstood and it's all these mean people at the news organizations that are putting all these terrible things out there. It's just propaganda, is it? Because, again, go back to that episode. I literally go down the list. I, like, picked a year randomly, went to Wikipedia, and just read the, about the attacks, read the breed, and read what happened. And it's two-year-olds having their throats ripped out. It's 80-year-old women being knocked down on the ground and being strangled to death by a dog. Again, a pit bull is not a pet. And I know your, your pit bull is different, right? Your pit bull would never snap. It would never snap, right? Until it does. And I, as I said in that episode, you wouldn't let your kid play with a rattlesnake. You wouldn't even let a rattlesnake be let loose in your home. 
Some of you are like, oh, I don't let my dog around my kid. Okay, just let a rattlesnake loose in the house. A house that you and your family lives in. You would think that's crazy, right? Well, having a pit bull loose in your house, in a lot of homes, is one of the most dangerous things that you could possibly do. So I know that's not going to gain me any friends. You know, of all the things I've talked about on the show, about abortion, about transgenderism, about politics, about everything in these 550 plus episodes, I've gotten more hate mail for the pit bull stuff, but I literally don't care. Because if right now today, we could snap our fingers and more than half, like, well, I, I could tell it to you this way, I'd said this on that podcast. If I could snap my fingers and make pit bulls, Rottweilers, Dobermans, and I forget what the other breed was. If if I could just, if those dogs just disappeared, they didn't die horrible deaths, but they just disappeared, we would essentially have no dog-related fatalities in America. This isn't like people falling off ladders and dying, because guess what? A ladder's not going to chase you down the street and beat you to death. This isn't like people falling into pools and drowning and not being able to get out, because the pool doesn't drag you in and keep you there. Whereas a dog, they will drag you down. And they will hold you there until they kill you. All right, guys, before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. At Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. Big drink of water here at the end. Again, we thank you so much to Jocko Fuel and our other people that support our show. In the show notes, we've got a link to everything I talked about today on the communism side, also the quick hitters. But again, thank you to our donors. There's our donation link. Go there and be a part of the team. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want me to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And also we want to thank the band Holy Name for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song, Perpetua, which is off their self-titled debut album on Face Down Records. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, keep seeking the Lion of Judah.